All right, we're going to continue today in section 9.2, and we're going to talk about multi-stage experiments. So before we can move to multi-stage experiments, we need to actually talk about what one-stage experiments are. The first thing we're going to look at in this section, um, sort of vocabulary-wise, is tree diagrams. Um, so tree diagrams are a sample space model where each, where each outcome is designated by a separate branch. Um, I'll draw them here in a minute. If you have a one-stage experiment, the experiment is over after one set, one step. Um, in terms of the tree diagram, there's one set of branches. And if you have a two-stage or a three-stage or a four-stage, a multi-stage experiment, there has that many numbers of branches. So two steps would be two sets of branches. So you can draw your tree diagram sort of from left to right or from top to bottom. It doesn't matter. Um, I'll do a baby tree diagram right here. So you can do it like this. If there were two outcomes, it would look like this. These are the branches on the tree. But you can do it from the top down if you like that better. I usually do from left right because my slides are set up that way. But you can do whatever you want on your paper. Um, you can have more than one, more than, than one, sorry, more than two outcomes. So for instance, um, you might have a tree diagram that looks like this with two outcomes of its heads and tails. Or we'll see an example today where you're having boys or girls, right, babies. Um, so these are two outcomes. Um, but there's definitely possibilities of having more than two outcomes for an experiment. Um, so for instance, if we were doing um, rolling the dice, we might be concerned with every single individual roll. So we'd have six branches, right? So it would look something like this. Right? There's six different outcomes possible. The way in which that differs from a multi-stage or a two-stage specifically experiment is that this is one stage. There's one set of branches. There's one node and there's one extension of branches off of it. However many branches there are, there's only one set. If you have a multi-stage experiment, you have another set sort of extending off of the first one. So you have set number one here, and then here's your set number two of your outcomes. So we'll see examples of this. For instance, let's say you had a two-child family, right? Outcome number one is either a boy or a girl. But then after you have sort of like this boy and this girl, you have baby number two. And again, you have another option. Whether you had a boy or a girl, you still have another option, a boy or girl, each time. So you end up with a tree diagram that looks something like this, OK? Along each of the branches of the tree diagram, we're going to write prob prob the probability of that branch. Now, a lot of times, our branches' probabilities are equally likely. We explored some of those last time, right? So in this tree diagram, they're equally likely. You're the 50-50 shot when you get pregnant having a boy or girl. That's what you have, right? Um, if you're flipping a coin, you have a 50-50 shot of rolling heads or rolling tails. But not all probabilities are like that. So sometimes, and I think my first example is one where they're equally likely is not happening. Like that doesn't actually happen, so the tree diagrams will not have the same numbers along them. So 9.6 actually talks about the multiplication rule for tree diagrams. So for all multi-stage experiments, the probability of an outcome along any path of the tree diagram is equal to the product of the probabilities along the path. So it will sound like a tongue twister, or like I'm repeating myself but changing the order around. Um, if you think about this picture, I'll flip, promise I'll flip back over here, but if you wanted to know the probability of having two boys, well, it's a one-half probability of having the first boy and a one-half probability of having the second boy, and you'd multiply those two one-halves together, so you have a one-fourth probability of having two boys. That's what that would look like. That's what it's talking about. You just multiply along the particular branch you're talking about. Um, there's a note on here that says, I expect to see tree diagrams or something equivalent. And I'll show you some equivalent things to that um, within this section, maybe today, maybe on Monday. Um, there's definitely a, a good chance that of the things that we're doing, you could do without a tree diagram. You could reason your way through it. You could figure it out in a different way. And I totally recognize that. Um, but if you were working with kids, um, which would be somewhere in that seventh grade age range probably, to do tree diagrams, they would be drawing tree diagrams. So I want you to get comfortable with drawing them too so that you're not asking them to do some reasoning that they're not capable of doing yet because their brain's not progressed to where yours has. So we're going to be drawing tree diagrams or something similar on every, um, every scenario we have for an experiment for. Um, independent events, um, which we've talked about, but we haven't defined. I talked about them last time. Independent events are events where the outcome of one has no effect on the outcome of the other. Right? So like my example with my boy-girl, like having the babies, the two babies in a row, 
Whether you have a boy or a girl the first time has absolutely no bearing over whether you have a boy or a girl the second time. They are completely independent events. Um, whether you flip heads or tails the, first, the second time has absolutely no bearing on whether you flipped heads or tails the first time. They're independent events. But not all events are independent. So imagine that you're doing some sort of a lottery, right? So everybody buys a raffle. We'll do a raffle. We're doing a raffle. So everybody buys a ticket, right? There's a 1,000 tickets in a bucket. So the first time somebody draws out a ticket, you had a 1 out of 1,000 chance if you had one ticket in there being drawn. Well, now that that ticket's not in there and there's only 999 tickets, the second time you have a better chances of being drawn than you did the first time because there's only 999 tickets in there now, right? So independent events don't always happen. A raffle would be an example of something that's not independent events. You know, draws from a raffle. If you do have independent events, then the probability of event one and event two happening, so this is event one followed by event two, is the product of those probabilities, okay? So that happens when we do have those independent events. And in that very real sense, that's what happened along the top branch. It's independent from your first baby to your second baby, which one gender it is, whatever. And so I'm multiplying along those tree branches independently. I can multiply them out. That's what's going on in that multiplication step and what's going on when we talk about our tree diagram multiplication rule. So we're going to do an example. Um, this one's more complicated than our boy-girl example. We'll do some more of those later. But on this one, it talks about a committee. Um, and our committee has a chance of going to Hawaii, but not all of them get to go. All right, so this is kind of like my raffle situation. We've got a big bucket and everybody's names are in the bucket. However, the description actually only asks us the questions, only asks us about the men versus the women going, not specific people, just the, the type of person, right? Just whether, which gender they are. Um, and it might make sense to ask this kind of question because it might affect your housing arrangements, right? Do you get one hotel room for everybody and just get a big hotel room, or do you have to have two? Something like that might be going on in the question. So this is the only scenario we care about. So while there are, in fact, ooh, let's see, 10 different members of the committee and they're all the 10 names are in the bucket, I don't need 10 branches because I really only care about their gender status as to this question. So you're going to have some questions along the way where, yeah, there's, there's 10 outcomes here, but I don't need to draw 10 branches because I'm only doing these categories that I'm, you know, I'm considering. I'm considering men versus women. So I only have two possible outcomes in terms of category here. I have the outcome where I draw a man's name or a woman's name. You can label it men, women. You can label it male, female. I don't care what you label it. You can pick. Um, so let's see what I did in my notes just so when I shift, shift back to it. I did men, women. So men on top, women on the bottom. That is a terrible M. Let's try that one more time. Better. Okay, so first time I draw, all the people's names are in the bucket. There are four women's names and there are six men's names. So there's 10 names in the bucket, right? Four of them are women. So I have a four out of 10 chance of selecting a woman's name. And six of them are men. So I have a six out of 10 chance of selecting a man's name. Now, it's important to realize that along each individual branch, like para branches, I should say, these have to add up to one. This has to explore all the possible outcomes, 100%. Six out of 10 plus four out of 10 is 10 out of 10. That's all possible outcomes are represented, okay? But I'm not just drawing one person to go to Hawaii. I'm supposed to be drawing three. That's what it said, I need three. So after I do the first draw, no matter who gets drawn, I have to draw again. So I'm gonna make another set of branches out from this. And again, my options are that I draw a man's name or a woman's name each time. But these are not independent events because whoever I selected out first directly affects how many men's or women's names are still in the bucket to be drawn. So as we do this, we have to go along the branch to figure out what's happening. So we're gonna start with our top branch. Okay, so there was a man's name drawn. The six out of 10 is no longer relevant, but there was a man's name drawn. So how many men's names are still in the bucket if I go along the first branch? There's only five now, only five men. So five men are left in my bucket out of the total of how many now? Nine. There's five out of nine names that are men's. And how many names are women's? Four. And so it's four out of nine. I don't really care whether you write the numbers above or the below the lines. They just need to be you know, connected to the lines in some fashion, close to them. Now, if I go along the bottom branch, I selected a woman's name the first time. So I've selected the woman's name the first time. 
these numbers are not necessarily going to match the numbers above, right? I selected a woman's name, so how many men are left in the bucket? Still the same six out of nine. And how many women's names are left in the bucket? Three out of nine. Now, a word of, um, I don't know, advice maybe. Tree diagrams can start to feel like, oh, man, I'm running out of space. I don't know how to make this work. So if you make your branches longer, you have more space. So as I'm working with this, I need to do another set of branches because I need to draw a third person. So I'm going to make my branches sort of long and skinny, and that actually gives me more space to write. The most branches you'll ever have to make um, is a four outcome, like four different draws of names, if you will, like for using this scenario. Okay, you'll never have to do one with more than four sets of branches. So again, at the end of all my branches are going to be M's and W's, right? So I have man, woman, man, woman, man, woman, man, woman. And I have to go along the branches to see what happened. So let's go along the very top branch. So along the very top branch, two men's names have been drawn, right? So how many men's names are left? Four. There are four left out of how many names total? Eight. Eight. And how many women's names? Four. The same four because none of them are drawn out of eight. So again, notice this set of branches adds up to one. Every set of branches has to do this, okay? Now the next one, now on the next set of branches, I've actually drawn one man's name and one woman's name. So you have to keep that in mind as you make your probability statements. I've drawn one man and I've drawn one woman. How many men's names are left in the basket? Five, and there's still eight, right? There's eight names that are layered. And how many women's names are left in the basket? Three out of eight. Now we're going down to the bottom. I've selected again one man and one woman. Now, I selected them in a different order, but if I've selected a man and a woman, the probabilities are going to be the same as the one above. One man's name was drawn, one woman's name was drawn, so I still have five-eighths chance of drawing a man's and a three-eighths of woman's. So that one actually duplicated this time. And in my last branch at the bottom, that does not look like a nine. It's a terrible number. How about a nine down here? That was supposed to be a nine. I don't know why it looked like a four. Okay, along this bottom branch, I drew a woman's name and a woman's name, so two women's names have been drawn. So how many men are left? Six out of eight, and how many women are left? Two. two out of eight, I'll put it here since I'm running out of space. So if I wanted to know the probability along any individual branch according to what I had seen before, right, that those multiplication rules, I just multiply along the branches, okay? Now let's look at the questions that are being asked because we don't wanna just randomly multiply things out, that seems unnecessary. Let's make sure that our multiplications are necessary. So the first question wants to know the probability of selecting all three women, okay? So over here, where are the all three women selected? Where's that category or where's that scenario? The very bottom one, right? It's these. And I just told you what we can do along any individual branch, so we're going to do it along that individual branch. We're gonna multiply four over 10 times three over nine times two over eight. So 4 over 10 times 3 over 9 times 2 over 8. And hopefully it becomes clear why it was necessary for us to talk about fractions and decimals before we got to this point. Sometimes your tree diagrams, like this one, are set up in fractionals. You know, fractions and you're looking at fractional numbers. Sometimes they're going to be set up in decimals. We need to be able to work with both in order to do this particular problem. You can reduce within each set of fractions. You can reduce along diagonals. Let's just reduce in each set of fractions first. Four and 10 both divide by two. So I have two over five. Three and nine both divide by three. So I have one over three. And then two and eight both divide by two. So I have one over four. Even if that's all I do, that's way better than it was before. So let's just pause there and do that part of it then. So now I have two times one times one, which gives me two. And on the bottom, I have five times three times four, which gives me 60. 60. And at the end, 
I wanna make sure, have I simplified everything? And this one is not quite. I didn't do all the simplification, but I can do it now. Two and 60 both divide by two. So we'll divide them both by two to give me one out of 30. It's not very likely, right? It's not, it's not very likely that this is going to happen and that all three are going to be women that are selected. We do have another question being asked. It wants to know the probability that at least one man is selected. So if you go back to this diagram, there's two different ways to do this problem. If you are looking, and I can see Kaylee doing it right now, at every branch that has a man on it, what do you notice? Which ones of the branches are those? Well, it's this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, because it draw, they drew a man first, so that one's got at least one man on the committee, right? Down here, it's this one, and this one, and this one. It's everything that part A wasn't, isn't it? So you have two options. If you want, you can multiply along all seven of those branches, and you can add them together. In other words, it would be seven times as much work as the first problem. And then you'd have to add it, right? Or you can remember that we had a probability of rule that said that one minus the probability of an event is the probability of the event's complement. Do you remember that from last time? This idea of having at least one man says that I can't have all women. That's what it says. And I know what the probability is of having all women. I just found it. So I can do this by taking one minus the probability that I had all women, namely one minus one thirtieth. If I get a common denominator, what will I get? Twenty-nine over thirty. Now that's not all men, but that's at least one man which is what I was asked for. If it's a one out of 30 chance of having all women on the committee, then there's a 29 out of 30 chance of having at least one man on the committee. So this is a good example of where a tree diagram becomes quite useful. Um, it's partially useful because the probabilities kept changing along the way. That, that's really part of the reason why it was useful to us. Um, but it also just kept it all organized in a nice, neat fashion. My next example I'm going to do, I'm not going to use a tree diagram for, although you could. I just want to show you some other options of how you can use the same kind of ideas to display the information in a way that would be considered um, appropriate or acceptable for this. On this one, a box contains five slips of paper, numbered four, six, seven, eight, and nine. A player reaches into the box and draws out two slips and adds them together. If the sum is even, the player wins. If the sum is odd, the player loses. So do you understand the experiment or the game they're playing first? Okay. So what we want to do is we want to figure out what are the different outcomes that are possible. So if I did a tree diagram on this one, it would be, it would be challenging because I have four, six, seven, eight, and nine. I'd have to draw five branches, and then I'd have to draw five branches off of each of those five branches, and it would be massive, wouldn't it? It really would. And so instead, what we're going to do, even though that's a possibility, is we're going to simply write out the possible outcomes. For example, I could draw a four, and once I draw it, I don't put it back in, so I could draw a four and a six. I'm just gonna write them sort of as an ordered pair. I draw a four, I draw a six. Uh, I could draw a four and a seven. I could draw a four and an eight. Or I could draw a four and a nine. Do I get them all? That's all the ways that I can have a four compared or, or combined with one of the other values. So then I exclude four in my discussion. I've already written all the ones down that have a four in it, so now we're gonna say that we didn't draw a four, we drew a six. Well, I don't need to rewrite six and four. I already wrote four and six. That's a duplicate. So I could have drawn six and seven, or six and eight, 
four, six, and nine. That's all the ways I can draw a six and combine it with something else. So I'm gonna exclude drawing sixes now. So maybe I don't draw a six and I draw a seven and an eight, or a seven and a nine. And then what's my last possibility? Eight and nine. Notice, part of what's allowing me to do this is that each of my draws is equally likely, not equally likely as the draw before, but equally likely to each other, right? Like when I had the men and the women, I didn't have equal numbers of men and women, so each of the probabilities were individually different. But if there's five numbers in there, I have a one-fifth probability of drawing each number out individually. Does that make sense? So this allows me to make this in a condensed form a little bit nicer. These are all my outcomes. How many of them are there? There's 10 outcomes. Instead of drawing a tree diagram that had five branches with five all along there, which would have kind of make it look like there's 25 outcomes, right? That's what it would have looked like. So we want to know the probability the player wins. So let's go back and discuss what did it say. How do you win this game? All right, so if their sum is even. So let's go through, and I'm just going to highlight them. We're going to you know, highlight them when they are even. 4 plus 6, is that even? Yes. How about 4 plus 7? No. 4 plus 8? Yes. 4 plus 9? No. So you could like check mark these if you don't want to highlight or don't have a color. 6 plus 7? No. 6 plus 8? Yes. 6 plus 9? No. 7 plus 8? No, seven plus nine? Yes, and eight plus nine? No. So I'm just counting, right? Because they were all equally likely to be drawn. So how many of them are even? Four. And how many outcomes did I have total? 10. So it's four out of 10. We will always reduce our probabilities. So four out of 10 would reduce to two out of five, two fifths. All right, divide them both by two. I'm going to change colors on my highlighter to do the next part because I'm changing the rules just a little bit. Part B asks, what happens if the two numbers multiply, are multiplied instead of added? Will the probability change? So you can ignore all my green marks. I'm going to mark in red. We're wanting to mark the ones that are going to be even when they're multiplied. Now, the cool thing about even is that it's easier to decide. And the reason it's easier to decide is that if I multiply any number that's even, I automatically get an even number. So I don't really need to know my multiplication tables that four times six is 24. The very fact that one of them, in this case both of them, is even means their product will be as well. So I can run through and everything that has an even number as, an, as a um, factor is going to be even. So fours and sixes and eights. How many of them were even? Nine, nine of them. The only one that's not is seven times nine. So the question asked, does the probability change if the two numbers are multiplied? And the answer, of course, is yes. And then the answer after that is that it's, what was it, 9 out of 10. It's a 9 out of 10 probability if I multiply them as opposed to adding them. Okay, I'm going to do one more example and then we'll pause for today because it's a nice spot to pause in truthfully. We're going to do an experiment that has to do with spinners. First, you're going to spin the first spinner and then you're going to spin the second spinner. Okay, so there's other ways you could do this. I'm going to do a tree diagram again because I want you to see another tree diagram. Um, but there's other ways you could probably write this out kind of like what we did over here with our, our ordered pairs would work. So in our tree diagram, the first question says to find the sample space. And the sample space just means all possible outcomes. So we'll do that in just a second. But I want to draw my tree diagram first so you can see what it would look like. So the tree diagram would show what happens when I spin the first spinner. And if I spin the first spinner, I get a 1 or a 2, right? There's two branches because there's two outcomes. But how many outcomes are there when I spin my second spinner? There's three. So the branches extending off of this now have three outcome options. And they are one, two, and three. So I have one, two, three, one, two, three. 
because each of my spinners are equally divided within the spinner, right? So like the first spinner, I have one and two as options. How likely am I to spin a number one? Like what's the probability, what'd you say? Uh, one, half. one half, yeah. And we could use decimals if you want, but in a moment it's not gonna be nice to use decimals for my second spinner, so I'm gonna still use fractions on this one. Um, I promise I'll use the decimals on another example next time. So it's a one-half chance I spin a one, it's a one-half chance I spin a two. What about on the second spinner? When I spin my second spinner, it's completely independent of the first spinner, it doesn't make any difference, but what's the likelihood, what does it look like visually, <laughs> at least trying to be portrayed, what's the likelihood of spinning a one? One-third. And a two? One-third and a three, one-third. And that's true for both of my branches. So this is my tree diagram, if I were to draw a tree diagram for this one as my um, descriptive you know, piece. So let's actually answer the questions that they ask first. They ask for the sample space. So a sample space is simply a list of the things that can happen. So I'm gonna put a curly brace, that's how we indicate sets. And that's what a sample space is, it's a set. So I could spend a one and a one. So I'm just gonna write it as one, one. If you don't like that, you're welcome to write it as ordered pairs, one, one. Okay, so whichever notation you like is totally fine. I'm gonna simplify mine, I'm just gonna write one, one. I could spin one, one, I could spin one, two, or I could spin one, three. Or I could spin two, one, or two, two, or two, three. And if you look along each of my branches, those are in fact my only options. One, 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 two, one, three, and the same thing below. So a sample space is just a listing of the things that could happen, okay? And then the other question asks about the probability of those things happening. So what is the probability of spinning two even numbers? So I would like to show you this both from the sample space perspective and from the tree diagram perspective. So the question asked about spinning two even numbers. So where is that going to happen? What outcome? Which one? Yeah, so it's the two twos, right? So I could actually just multiply along those branches. It's one half times one third. which gives me one sixth, okay? Now, the other way that you could do that is that you could have, you have, and that doesn't always work, it works here, because everything in the first branches was one halves and everything in the second branches is one thirds. So if I multiply along any branch, I get one sixth. Do you guys see that? So I have six outcomes here, and every single one of them has a one sixth probability. They're all equally likely. So if I know that, and it works, which it does here, I can simply see that this is only one out of six options for which this is happening, and therefore my probability as well is one out of six. Okay, that's kind of, that perspective is how we did this problem. We looked at the outcomes and we did some counting because they were all equally likely. The next question says, spinning at least one, two. So at least one, two means anything that has a two in it. So I'll change colors, um, we'll do green. This one has a two in it. This one, this one, and this one, right? How many green branches was that? How many did I highlight? Four, or you can count them up from over here. One, two, three, four. Four of them have at least one two in them, right? At least one two means two or more one or more twos. <laughs> so I have four branches that are each one sixth, if I'm thinking about it from the tree diagram. Or you can simply count that I have four out of the six options here. Either way, this is four out of six, which reduces to two out of three. The last one says spending exactly one, two. I'll circle these in purple. So this branch is exactly one, two. This branch is exactly one, two. And this branch is exactly one, two. Or if I'm counting from over here, this one has exactly one, two. This one and this one. So what's the probability I'm going to spend exactly one, two? Yeah, three sixths, which is one half. 
So any questions on those? Okay, so we're about to pause. I'm going to keep the recording going for just a second more since we have a couple people gone. 9.1, you don't have to do tree diagrams. They're all single stage things, right? It's 9.2 where all this becomes effective. So as we shift back into 9.1, keep in mind we're not, we're not doing quite the same section of material. 